Welcome everybody. On behalf of GCUS and Executive Director Dr. Jorge Brenner, my name is Chris Simonello and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager for GCUS. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Osborne, a research scientist in the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystems Division at NOAA AOML. And Emily is based in Miami and her work is focused on using a range of techniques and sensors to investigate biogeochemical issues related to ocean health and climate. And we're fortunate to have Emily as a valuable member of the GCAN team that's coordinated by Jen Vreeland. And Jen is also on the technical side of today's webinar. So thanks, Jen, for all your help today. She'll be helping us with the uh, management of the questions too as you enter them in the chat box. Um, Emily is also a part of a federal steering committee that's appointed by the Subcommittee on Global Ocean Change Research that is tasked with the development of the fifth national climate assessment She's the federal coordinating lead author for the Oceans and Marine Ecosystems chapter, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about that today. So without further ado, here's Emily presenting her talk titled, Using Biogeochemical Argo Technology to Observe Gulf of Mexico Biogeochemistry in Near Real Time. All yours, Emily, thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction, Chris, and, and thanks again to GQs for the opportunity to present um, some of the work that we have gotten off the ground in the last couple of years at AOML. So hopefully everyone can see my screen clearly. Um, so on this first slide, uh, I've included my email contact information. I'll have it again on the final slide. If you have follow-up questions, you want to learn more about Argo observing technology, you're interested in using the data for some of your work in the Gulf, um, or if you have education outreach opportunities that you want to connect on, please um, follow up and, and connect with me. I'll be really happy to hear from you. Um, so the title of my talk today is Using Biogeochemical Argo Technology to Observe Gulf of Mexico Biogeochemistry in Near Real Time. So as Chris mentioned, um, I work at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory down in Miami, Florida. And when I came to AOML um, about two years ago now, I began working with Argo technology for the very first time. So when I was working on pulling together the slides for this talk and, and knowing that it's a lunch and learn, I wanted to kind of start from uh, just the core basics of what is uh, the Argo technology? What kind of measurements uh, are being collected by the Argo array? And how are the data processed? And how are they served? And how can you access them and potentially use them for your work? So I'm going to kick off with some introductory background information. And I'll pause um, and see if there are any questions. And then I'll launch into the second half of the talk where I focus more on the work specifically in the Gulf of Mexico. And by all means, um, feel free to ask questions. And Chris, Jen, if you want to holler and ask questions and, and interrupt me, um, I'm happy to do kind of a give and take during um, the talk today. OK. All right. So this here is a map uh, that is showing, as of yesterday, the distribution of Argo floats across the global ocean. So at any given time, there are about 4,000 Argo floats that are out there drifting around and making important ocean measurements um, and returning to them to us in near real time. So about half of the dots that are shown on this map are supported by uh, the United States, and the other half of um, the floats that are made up of the global array are supported by a number of uh, international partners. So there are more than 30 countries that participate in the International Argo Program, and it really represents a, a coordinated long-term effort for observing what's going on out in the open ocean. So this map here is uh, similar to the last one, but it's color-coded based on Argo mission. So the dominant color that you see across this map um, are floats that are core Argo floats. And core Argo floats represent the um, longest time series of measurements that we have. Um, core floats were launched starting in the late 1990s. So we have several decades worth of data coming from these core Argo floats. And the core measurements um, that are being made on these platforms are temperature and salinity and they're being made over the upper 2,000 meters of the water column. 
You'll see that there are a couple of other missions that have come online um, just within the last decade and, and really have taken off in the last couple of years. Uh, the first is the Deep Argo mission, which is represented by these dark navy dots, and then there's a couple mustard dots. It might be hard to, to find because there aren't that many Deep Argo floats that are out. This is an emerging and developing technology where we do have floats, they're kind of distributed in pilot arrays. And these floats are capable of measuring temperature and salinity all the way down to 6,000 meters within the water column. And so they will really help to unveil how ocean heat is building up and changing uh, within the greatest depths of the ocean. And the last Argo mission, which I'll spend the rest of my time talking with you about today, is the Biogeochemical Argo mission, or BGC Argo mission. The BGC floats uh, here are shown in these kind of neon green dots. You'll see that there's a decent global distribution of our BGC floats. As of uh, last month, we had just shy of 300 operational BGC Argo floats. Um, across the global ocean. In the future, the target is for uh, a larger fraction of the Argo array to be made up of these deep and BGC Argo floats. Um, there, within the last couple of years, has been a massive financial investment by the United States through the National Science Foundation to launch 500 BGC Argo floats over five years. That project is, I think, at the start of its third year now and is well on its way to supporting um, the U.S.'s half of the proposed BGC Argo array for the global ocean. So you may be thinking to yourself, Emily, what is a BGC Argo float? Well, a BGC Argo float is a, essentially a core Argo float that has a lot of additional sensors mounted on it. So the jump into the BGC Argo space represented Argo um, not only measuring chemistry um, and physics, but moving into biology as well. And so our BGC Argo floats are capable of measuring temperature and salinity with their basic CTD that's been on all of the core Argo floats, but they're also equipped with oxygen optode, a nitrate sensor, a pH sensor, a backscattering and fluorometer, <clears throat> which is uh, in one bioptical sensor. So we're measuring chlorophyll A fluorescence at 435 nanometers wavelength and the optical backscattering coefficient at 700 nanometers wavelength. And some Argo floats, none of the ones that we are working with at AOML, um, but there are floats out there that also have a fifth sensor mounted, which is an irradiance sensor, which is able to tell us how deep sunlight is penetrating um, into the ocean. All of these sensors are designed to be able to withstand up to 2,000 decibars of pressure. So they're operating over those uh, that kind of standard 2,000 meter profile depth that the core array has operated with over time. Um, so uh, obviously, these floats are quite complex. Um, they are um, designed and engineered by a number of uh, a handful of different companies across the United States. As the floats are being built, they are rigorously tested. There are calibration coefficients, which we get for every single sensor. And then they are packed up and sent to us, uh, typically a, uh, making a full cross-country journey to get to our lab in Miami. Our floats have been coming from Seattle. And so when they get to us, we again um, do a ton of pre-deployment um, testing to make sure the communications um, are working, that we can get good GPS fixes, that all of the sensors are behaving in a way that we would expect them to, that the flotation and, and bladder um, inside of the float, which controls um, how it moves through the water column, are fully operational. And we put a lot of effort into doing this because when we launch the float, ideally we will never see it again. So these are battery operated instruments, they're free drifting. And so when we drop them off the side of the ship, they're out there anywhere from five to six to seven years in a best case scenario. And so all this rigoring, rigorous testing on the front end, make sure that we're getting the best data possible and make sure that we're not launching a float that we might never hear from again. 
So just some interesting trials and tribulations that we've gone through um, in our float adventures so far. Uh, so in the top right, you'll see uh, the result of some of our pre-deployment testing. So this is a float that we got uh, here in-house AOML tested. It was fully operational. We were ready to send it out to sea and we sent it for one final test where we uh, ensured that it could withstand um, the 2000 decibars worth of pressure as it sinks through the water column at just an immense amount of pressure. And it turns out this particular float could not handle that pressure. So unfortunately, the float is fully collapsed. Um, it's flat as a pancake uh, in this picture. Uh, but fortunately, this happened in the lab and it was just the outside hull of the float. So all the fragile, important electronics and sensors were taken off uh, to do this test. So they were fully intact. And so we've been able to switch out the hull and we're now um, getting ready to deploy um, uh, this float within the next couple of months. So deployment uh, is really simple. Uh, once you get all of your testing behind you and you make sure you have a float that's, that's ready to go to sea, um, we're typically looking for uh, platforms of opportunity um, to deploy the floats. Um, so these are ships that are going out into the open ocean as the floats are profiling over a 2000 meter interval. We really ideally like to deploy them at about 2,500 meters worth of water depth. Um, that just makes sure that when we deploy the float and it does that first initial profile right away, that we're not hitting the bottom. And so uh, the floats, when they go to sea, are put in a what's called a pressure activation mode. And uh, when they hit the, the water, um, they essentially know that they are immersed in seawater and they begin their mission automatically. So um, deployment of the float is actually quite easy and we often have um, partners that, that do these deployments on our behalf out at sea. When we're deploying biogeochemical Argo floats, we really ideally like to partner with cruises that are collecting um, CTDs at, uh, as a part of their core mission. That way we can have bottle data at the site of the float deployment. And so we can essentially have an independent validation data set to look at the first profile that um, is being returned by the float sensors in comparison to uh, lab measured bottle data. And so we like to have Winkler, oxygens, nutrients, specifically nitrate, uh, pH, and or other carbonate system um, measurements like total alkalinity or PCO2. And then we also ideally like to collect seawater filters um, at two depths at the surface and the um, deep chlorophyll maximum so that we can look at HPLC pigment analysis and also particulate organic carbon to compare to our biological data sets. We are always looking for uh, deployment platforms to partner with. So if you or a colleague um, has a cruise that's going out into the Gulf that you think could potentially uh, spare some room for a BGC float, um, please contact me. I am making lots of connections with folks that are going out. Um, it's pretty simple to actually deploy the float and um, it can potentially benefit some of the science that's being conducted on the cruise. We can rap rapid cycle the float, get some cool data while the ship is out there operating, collecting um, CTDs and other measurements or potentially glider measurements. Um, so if you have any connections and would like to connect and um, potentially partner with us on deployments, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. So the standard Argo mission uh, represents approximately a 10 day cycle, although we can modify uh, this cycle, which I'll talk a bit uh, at the end of this slide about. But the way that a, an Argo float is programmed is for upon deployment, um, the float is collecting a, a profile immediately. And after that first profile is collected, it sinks back down to what we call its park depth which is right around 1,000 meters. When it's hanging out at 1,000 meters and parking, it's staying there for about nine days. There are very few measurements that are actually being made at the park depth. It's typically checking to make sure, am I at the right pressure? Am I a bit below or above 1,000 meters? And it will adjust its bladder to make sure it's coming back and it's hanging around 1,000 meters as closely as possible. There are a couple of underway kind of spot measurements that you can turn on to have the float make, but largely it's in a hibernation mode where it's conserving battery. 
around that nine day interval, the float will begin ascending to its 2000 meter uh, maximum depth. And once it hits 2000 meters, all the sensors uh, turn on and begin making measurements during the ascent. The ascent from 2000 meters all the way to the surface takes anywhere from six to eight hours, depending on sea state. And when the float uh, reaches the surface, it has um, an antenna um, and part of its sensor package, which fully emerge out of uh, the surface ocean. If we don't uh, get out of the surface ocean, the comms antenna cannot transmit the data. So it's really important that we have the head of the float fully emerging out. And from there, we get a GPS fix and the data are transmitted to us. That transmission time uh, generally for our floats has taken anywhere from five to 10 minutes. But at max, the float's going to be at the surface for 30 minutes um, transmitting the data. The way that the data are transmitted to us is through the Iridium satellite array, which is an uh, array of 66 satellites that fan uh, the surface of the Earth. So at any given time when a float surfaces, there's a satellite covering this geographic area that the float is in. The data is sent to that satellite and then pinged between satellites until it hits over the data center, which is in Arizona. And then from there, the data come to us. It's a process that moves pretty quickly. The floats actually have a SIM card inside of them. It's very similar to a cell phone technology, the way that data are sent to us. And through the Iridium um, satellite communication system, we it, it enables us to have two-way communication with the floats. So while the floats are sending us lots of data, we also send the float a package with instructions of how to operate every time it connects. And so this means that if we know that there is an interesting phenomena happening within our region, we can cycle the floats more rapidly. We can change the depth at which the float is parking, um, et cetera. We can put the float into recovery mode. There's lots of things that we're able to do to alter that standard mission that I've described on this slide. So I think I mentioned earlier, but uh, just to reiterate, the floats are battery operated. And so they're designed um, for all of the sensor packages, the bladder system, anything that consumes energy. Um, they're designed for the batteries to allow the floats to collect 250 profiles. And given um, if we're operating on our the standard 10 day cycle, our floats ideally should live anywhere um, to about six and a half years. The average lifespan of a BGC float is between four and five years. There are some floats that go much longer. There are some floats that uh, don't last very long at all. So it's kind of um, depends on the state and if there are any kind of premature failures of different elements of the floats um, that go down. So this is a slide with a ton of information and it's not meant for you to read or maybe absorb anything on this slide aside from the fact that the Argo data system is one that's been um, developed over the course of decades. It's an extremely robust um, data system. There are very well established handbooks, protocols, um, and approaches to um, processing the data and performing the real-time quality control checks and also the delayed mode quality control checks. And um, so when float data are transmitted via the Iridium satellite array and they come into our data servers, all of the US um, PIs that are operating floats have their data flowing into one data assembly center. That data assembly center happens to be here at AOML. So AOML is receiving all of the US Argo data as it comes in in real time. And our AOML data assembly um, center or DAC is taking the data, decoding it. So taking the sensor kind of count information, pairing it with that um, float calibration and making real kind of usable scientific information and also doing a first pass of real time quality control, making some minor adjustments to the data and also flagging it. From there, the data is pushed to a global data assembly center. There are two um, GDACs, they're called. They're mirrored, image, like perfect mirrors of one another. So we have redundancy in case one goes down, the other is still operational. And one is hosted by the US, one is hosted in Europe. And from there, the data are also fed to the global telecommunication system or the GTS. Right now, temperature, salinity, and oxygen are being passed to the GTS. 
And from there, operational forecasters are able to pull GTS data coming from our Argo floats and use them for operational forecasts, for example. Um, in terms of science applications, uh, so if there are researchers that are wanting to pull Argo data for global model simulations or process studies looking at floats within a, a specific reason for science applications, we don't recommend using the real-time data stream. We recommend using the delayed mode quality control data stream um, that has gone through a rigorous um, kind of check float by float uh, that the PI has looked at um, to ensure that the data are meeting the highest quality standards as possible. So that delayed mode quality control check, uh, just these are a couple examples of, of some of the things that we do. So this is an example of, uh, there's one, there's lots of software that have been developed for our, the Argo community to make sure that we're delayed mode quality controlling our data using similar um, approaches. So this is one such software, a beautiful uh, GUI, which makes it very easy to visualize and to correct your data. So what you're looking at here is one Argo float that has been operating, it's collected 160 cycles. So you can see the data on this side, on the left side are just um, showing uh, on the x-axis your date. This is the same exact data over here on the right side. It's just uh, showing it by cycle. And what you're looking at is the float data, which is in blue, compared to our reference data, which is in red. So the reference data pulls from the World Ocean Atlas and uses uh, linear interpolation methods to estimate what your float uh, value should be uh, for nitrate and for pH. Uh, we use deep reference layer um, corrections. Uh, the reason for this is because in the deep ocean, pH and nitrate are extremely um, constant. And so we use a, a pressure range of anywhere right around 1500 decibars or 1500 approximately meters. We'll use our reference value to say, okay, nitrate should be 34 and my float is measuring it as 32, so I need to make an offset correction for the entire profile of two um, nitrate units to, to correct the data. So all of that to say, uh, so this is uncorrected data and then when we're able to correct the data, this is uh, ultimately what, for example, a nitrate time series would look like. Um, for oxygen data, as another example, the gold standard for correcting um, our float data is by using our in-air oxygen measurements. So the oxygen optode actually fully emerges when the float is transmitting data and it makes one atmospheric measurement when it's out. So then we can compare that oxygen atmospheric measurement made by the sensor to um, an NSEP global oxygen, atmospheric oxygen product, and then use that offset to fully correct the full profile. So this figure here in green is showing the real-time measurements that are made by the sensor. In blue, this is the sensor corrected oxygen data. And in red is the bottle Winkler um, titration oxygens, uh, just showing the excellent agreement between um, the bottle and the D mode or delayed mode data that we are correcting using our in-air oxygen data. I think this uh, example also really nicely highlights um, while we could not get by and do any of this work without ship-based bottled data, you can see in this example from our Argo profile, which has much higher resolution than any CTV cast ever could, um, that we're able to pick up features like this kind of pulse of low oxygen around 175 meters water depth um, that was just simply missed because we have a gap in the, the bottles that were collected across this interval. So um, just kind of goes to show the resolution and, and value that Argo data is definitely bringing to the table. Um, this is just for reference. I'm not going to go through every detail on this slide, but you can um, check out whatever your variable of interest is over here um, that's being measured by our BGC Argo floats and look at the associated accuracy and precision uh, that's reported for the delayed mode quality control data coming from the Argo array. So um, this is another slide that's gonna have um, lots of information that you can use later um, for reference if you're interested in taking a dive into Argo data. 
Um, so all of the Argo, full Argo array um, information can be pulled from those two um, Argo data assembly centers, the global data assembly centers that I had described a couple slides ago. You download them there and in that CDF format, and these are the two um, FTP links that you can use to pull um, information. But there are lots of other ways that you can look at the data. For our um, AOML array, we've created a ERDAP server. We're hoping to serve up our data on GPUSE's Gandalf in the future. There are other um, platform, web platforms that allow you to kind of visualize basic load information and data um, that does that won't require you to manipulate that CDF files, which can be a bit complex. And when you go to those GDAC pages, you might be like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to go. So ArgoViz or the biogeochemical argo.org website are really great places. EuroArgo um, is a European hosted platform, which is excellent for kind of toggling off which parameters you're interested in, which years you're interested in, and you can quickly visualize float data and also get um, links to where you can download the data in several different formats and in, in CSV. So you can look at things in Excel um, or obviously NetCDF, which is the preferred format for Argo data. And um, there are more and more tools um, or tutorials that are coming online for new users as we anticipate launching more and more BGC Argo floats in the future, we wanna make sure that folks know how to access and visualize and manipulate the data. So there's some toolboxes and tutorials, um, which I've included a link here, which I can definitely um, provide these slides to GPUs and or if you wanna contact me directly, I can um, point you in the right direction there. So that was the first half of my talk and I'm gonna just do a quick break and see if there are any questions that have come in from the audience um, before rolling into the second half. I don't see any in the chat or the question box. Could it give folks a, a minute or so to enter any questions they might have? Yeah, please. Of course, I have several, but I'm the moderator. I'm not supposed to ask any, so I will give <laughs> our participants first dibs on the question. <laughs> I guess while we're waiting for folks to ask, um, I guess one question is, is access to the visualization on the DAC open access or is that currently password protected? Everything is uh, open access. I should have made that super clear. So all of the data that are collected by Argo are freely and publicly available. Um, so no password protection, you can get in. I think the biggest hurdle to working with Argo data is having the right tools and knowing where to go. Um, and there are more and more researchers coming online to help kind of direct folks to how to do those two things. Thanks, and still seeing no questions. I'm going to ask you one more before we go on. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about with your, um, Quality control, control in the delayed mode, quality control. How do you know what you're seeing on the Argo float is not more accurate or higher resolution than what you're seeing as some of the comparative data? Right, that's a really great question. So um, I am relatively new to this whole delayed mode quality control world, but I was actually just meeting last week with the woman that generated that beautiful GUI software that I was showing you screenshots of. And when the community began developing protocols for this delayed mode quality control assessment, and they're looking at the reference data, and they're looking at the float data, they were really trying hard to match the two up one to one. And what they realized over time in a lot of different instances is that the reference data obviously isn't able to kind of pick up some of these maybe unusual phenomena that are coming in that, that the sensors are. And so they've really pulled back on the thresholds at which they're they're pairing the data. So they want them to generally align, but if there are deviations, we believe that the sensor data um, are capturing kind of variability in the way that the reference data isn't. So it's a little bit of a dance to make sure we're correcting the data to get it on track, but not over correcting to kind of dull out any of the interesting science that, that might be emerging from the data set. Thank you. 
I don't see any other questions in the uh, chat or the question box. So if you'd like to continue Brett. on, thank you. Emily, Please, there is one question. Yeah, there is one question for you, Emily. Um, how do you correct for bifouling impacts on sensors over time? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, one of the reasons that the floats are parking at a thousand meters is because we want to make sure that they are deep enough that biofouling isn't an issue. And so when we're operating out in the open ocean, I think the thing that we're probably most concerned with is that bio-optical sensor having um, a film forming on the surface with where they're parking, we just simply don't see that happening. So it's kind of a little bit in the design of making sure that we're keeping the floats at a depth where we don't have buildup um, or biofouling on the sensors and they're not spending much time at the surface. Um, so we generally don't see issues with that because of that reason. Great. And actually, I do have a question for you, Emily, um, and this is regarding how you are preparing to deploy uh, Argo floats. Um, you know, typically in, in my background, you know, we can look to see um, what gliders are out there at what particular time, but there are a lot of floats out there. And how do you determine, is there somewhere that you can look to determine like what's out there before you deploy your own? How does the process um, you know, how is that being handled? Yeah, that's a great question, Jen. So the way that we decided where to launch our floats uh, was pretty linked to the platform that we were partnering with to actually launch the floats. So there are a lot of criteria. We have to make sure that we're in deep enough water. We have to find a platform that's collecting all these validation data sets that we want to have. And so a lot of it is just kind of predetermined of what ships can we find, what ships of opportunity can we find to get out there and get the floats in the water. Once they're actually launched, um, they're drifting with the currents. So they're moving around, in our case, in the Gulf of Mexico a ton, um, as compared to other programs which are launching floats out in the middle of the Pacific or the Atlantic, they're not drifting nearly as much as our floats are in the Gulf. So as much as we maybe want to target putting a float in a particular location, it's definitely not going to stay there. And with that being said, there are lots of um, Argo floats, core Argo floats that are operating in the Gulf of Mexico. We have about anywhere from 20 to 30 um, in the Gulf at any given time. But for our BGC Argo floats that we launched, um, these are actually the first floats of their kind. So wherever we put them, we were um, kind of putting floats out there that were unparalleled. Very cool. Thank you. All right, I'm going to roll into the rest of my slides. OK, so turning our attention to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so I really don't need to orient this audience uh, to the importance of the Gulf, uh, but bear with me. So the Gulf is the largest uh, marginal sea in uh, North America. We have a huge US EEZ with important commercial fisheries. Uh, we have uh, important ecosystems that are providing ecosystem services and coastal protection. And ocean biogeochemistry is central to understanding and predicting how ecosystems are going to respond, um, particularly to climate change in the future. And we really had a lack of observations with respect to biogeochemistry in the open Gulf region um, prior to the deployment of these floats. Um, so when I refer to open gulf, I'm talking about anything that's greater than 2,000 meters water depth. Uh, and we are all familiar with the Gulf of Mexico and the fact that we have this huge dominant current system, the loop current, which is um, exerting a huge influence over particularly the open uh, gulf region. It's shedding anticyclonic and cyclonic eddies and uh, setting up these um, anomalies across the basin, which we're definitely seeing in our BGC Argo data. It's providing both challenges and opportunities uh, to our program as it really makes our floats move fast sometimes, um, but it's uh, resulting in some really exciting science questions that we're able to ask um, in terms of how does the loop current affect uh, Gulf of Mexico biogeochemistry. And so 
as I was just kind of referring to and talking with Jen, uh, these floats are floats uh, from AOML. We're launched in the Gulf in September and October of 2021. We purchased four floats. Um, and just to, to give you a sense, when you order a BGC Argo float, it's going to take at least a year for it to be produced and for it to actually get into your hands. From there, you need to do pre-deployment testing, find a platform for deployment. So it's anywhere from a year and a half to two years from the inception of we have the money, we have the idea to deploy a float to actually getting it into the water. So we have these four floats. Uh, they're about 100K a pop, so definitely a, a big investment. Um, we've had three of them that have been operating beautifully within the Gulf. One of them, unfortunately, we launched and we simply never heard from again. It's one that we didn't see any issues with in all of our pre-deployment testing. It was seemed fully operational. Um, unfortunately, what we think happened was that there was an issue with the bladder in this float and it was a bit sticky. And so when the float was um, kind of fully extending its piston and this bladder was in its most collapsed, fa collapsed phase, it was sticking a bit to the inside and it wasn't allowing the float to fully get to the surface and emerge its antenna to transmit data. So we think it's probably still been operating, um, but we simply just don't get the data from it, uh, which is unfortunate, but that is what happens when you work with ocean technology that you put in the ocean and don't hear back from necessarily. Um, so since deployment, we have collected more than 100 profiles. So this is a map here showing the locations of all of the profiles. So every circle represents a profile that we've gotten back. Uh, these have generally been collected on 10-day intervals. We found out really quickly that um, the park depth of 1,000 meters in the Gulf of Mexico didn't work for us. The, Gulf, or the loop stream is exerting an influence well over the upper 1,000 meters of the water column. So we dropped our park depth down to 1,500 meters, which meant that there was a little bit more chill in the drift that was happening during the park phase. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this float over here, uh, float 4903625. These seven digit numbers are the WMO IDs. Um, so this is an identifier that is makes it easy for anyone to look up uh, all the data associated with our floats. Um, but for this particular float over here in the eastern part of the basin, uh, as you may suspect, was very quickly entrained in the loop current and we've actually recovered that float. So I'll talk a bit about that in a couple slides. So to, to um, give a nod to the data gap um, that we're filling with these floats. I mentioned earlier that there are lots of core Argo floats that have been and continue to operate in the Gulf of Mexico, but the three floats that we've operated in this region are the first biogeochemical Argo floats that have ever um, been in this region. This is a, a figure here on the left showing the data in the World Ocean Database, or WD18. Um, this is data that spans all the way from 1933 to 2018, and there are a total of 35 pH profiles in the Gulf of Mexico in waters that are deeper than 2,000 meters. And within the first year and a half of our operation within the Gulf, our floats collected um, almost three times as much data. We would have had more, um, but one of the floats had a failed pH sensor, so we have two platforms that were making pH measurements. Um, and so just a, a massive increase in the amount of data that we're getting from the open ocean, which is going to allow us to, A, look at how are things varying seasonally when we have episodic storm events, how are things happening on shorter time scales, um, and then also as our time series persists over time, we're really excited to look at interannual long-term kind of climate scale changes um, as we move into uh, collecting years and years and hopefully decades of data. So I mentioned uh, earlier, this is just kind of a fun side story, that one of our floats that we launched was quickly picked up by the loop current, so it started moving south very fast. And uh, for those that are familiar with the bathymetry in the Gulf, um, this Florida Strait region between um, the tip of Florida and, and Cuba can get quite shallow, um, definitely shallower, that's shallower than 2,000 meters. And so we knew that we needed to go out and actually retrieve the float. So we were able, using that two-way communication, to put the float into what's called recovery mode, 
So it comes all the way to the surface and it stays at the surface. With the last GPS fix that we got, uh, before putting it into recovery mode, we contacted the US Coast Guard as well as the Coastal Data Information Program, or CDIP, and they were able to create projections, which I'm showing here, of where they thought the float would go over the next couple of days. And so from there, we uh, were able to get a fishing charter, uh, a small boat out of Key West, where they were very excited to go out on this exciting adventure and help us recover this float instead of fishing that day. And uh, we recovered the float um, pretty close off of uh, the edge of, of Cuba. And so this is the, that small boat. These are two NOAA researchers out there. And this is the, the float itself. So it's really pretty difficult to see the, there was a lot of sargassum that was around uh, the float when it was collected. And there's just a few little pieces that are sticking up. So we kind of miraculously were able to find it and pick it up. We were getting GPS fixes um, once a minute and we had a satellite phone that we were calling and, and uh, phoning the lat long of the float to our boat. Um, but at the time of collection, the float was moving at like a meter per second in the in the loop current. And so it was really challenging to pin down exactly where it was, but we were able to do that. And an even more fortunate finding was that when we brought the float back to the lab, we found out that it had some early kind of issues with um, its vacuum and, and bladder, which meant it was probably gonna fail um, prematurely. So we've been able to send it back to the manufacturer who is fixing it, testing it, and we'll hopefully be able to redeploy this one within the next six months. So some of the science that we are targeting uh, using our array is we're, we're really excited to look at how our offshore signals um, that are being measured by the BGC floats um, being propagated inshore. Uh, one specific example is we want to take float profiles that are being collected in specifically anticyclonic and cyclonic eddies and look at the biogeochemical signatures associated with those eddies and how those eddies um, are moving onshore specifically in the Flower Gardens Bank National Marine Sanctuary and potentially providing um, thermal relief or thermal stress uh, to the reef systems there. So we're partnering with the Flower Garden Banks and potentially gonna be launching a float with them and another opportunity that we've had was to rapid cycle um, a couple of our floats uh, in the wake of Hurricane Ian. So our floats were just on the fringe of the storm and we were able to cycle them on 12 hour intervals. And we see really interesting um, and pronounced differences uh, in the biogeochemistry associated with the pre and post storm signal. Uh, so we're working on, on writing up um, these results now. And then we're also using um, the BGC Argo floats data um, to monitor the biological carbon pump. So the biological carbon pump is the ocean's um, main pathway for drawing down carbon and sequestering it on long time scales. This is done through um, primary productivity and carbon fixation in the surface. And as that carbon is exported out of the euphotic zone, um, it's uh, sinking and slowly degrading and breaking down, but a very small fraction is actually sequestered and stored over long time scales. And so this has proven to be a really challenging uh, phenomena to observe, and we're integrating a lot of different observing techniques, including the BGC Argo floats being a really critical part of the picture to look at. Um, what is primary production doing in the surface for our particulates? Um, how dense are they in the surface? How do they degrade at depth? Are there instances where we see them aggregating together? Does that mean that they are more efficiently transporting carbon at depth? We're using oxygen data to kind of estimate what our organic carbon flux is using some stoichiometric relationships. Um, so these are just a couple of kind of early ideas of things that we're doing with the data. And I mentioned that we're pairing the Argo float data with other observing technologies. We've also recently, within the last year, launched a sediment trap time series in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. So this is up on the slope in about 1200 meters water depth, um, just south of um, New Orleans. And uh, the sediment trap is out there collecting our ocean particulates. So we're able to link um, measurements that are being made by 
the BGC Argo floats uh, with the sediment traps themselves. We're seeking support to mount some bioptical sensors on the traps, and we're also looking at the physical particulates that are collected by the traps um, to kind of pull together all of these sensor and, and physical data sets that we're collecting and establishing a better understanding of how to kind of interpolate between the two. Um, and we're also doing some exciting work using the sediment trap to look at who biologically is contributing to particulate fluxes at depth. Um, and I'm going to run through the next couple of slides really quickly because I think I'm getting close to time. But essentially, we're looking at um, uh, the bacterial and archaea communities using 16S metabarcoding and also the eukaryote uh, communities using uh, 18S metabarcoding on these bulk sediments. And essentially, it's it's allowing us to look at biologically who is making it to uh, the sediments um, at depth. And so these are a couple of figures, uh, some preliminary results looking at the 16S data, uh, which is showing essentially the change in diversity that we see over time in a six month period. That's matching up with um, how the mass flux that we're collecting at the sediment trap, which is essentially how much material is coming to the trap. So it in, seems intuitive that we would have more material and therefore more diversity, but we're able to really parse down into this enormous um, eDNA data set that we're generating to look at what are the different taxonomic groups um, that are showing up, who is associated with uh, these higher particulate organic carbon fluxes, therefore who is kind of associated with being uh, more efficient with transporting carbon to depth, um, et cetera. And so lots of data, we're just beginning to parse through all of it, but kind of taking a, a holistic view on biogeochemical cycling and using different technologies and pulling different pieces together and different disciplines together um, to answer these really complex questions. Something we've uh, launched uh, as we've started our program is uh, an adopt a float program. So as we get floats in and we deploy them, we try to connect with universities um, to uh, provide a lecture, um, to provide some information on data visualization, data utility, and we, um, with the, the last deployments that we did, were able to actually have the students decorate some styrofoam cups, which we then sent out um, on the cruise, and they we shrunk, we shrunk the, the cups in association with our CTD cast, so the, uh, the students got little mementos from our Adopt-A-Float um, program that we have launched. So if you have uh, a class that you think would be interested in hearing about BGC Argo as a part of their curriculum or connecting on the work that we're doing, um, please keep that in mind. And with that, um, I promised I would drop my email one more time. Um, so I will stop there and take any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Emily. That was really a lot of fascinating information. I'm Really impressed at how far the program's come in such a short time. Thank you. I'm anybody seeing any questions in the chat or in the question box? I am not seeing any. General Jorge, do you see any there? No, I don't see any, but um, let's give it a little bit of time. I do have a quick question for Emily, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, Emily, I am uh, really curious as how you account for, you know, um, unforeseen storms or whatnot, kind of throwing things off base on, on currents, pushing them onto shore potentially. Does that happen? I'm just kind of curious about that. Is there any method of controlling the situation? <laughs> Totally. Uh, we've definitely been thinking about that more in the Gulf than I think the average float operator does um, out in the open ocean. We have been working with um, a group that is using HICOM global like ocean circulation simulations to estimate the locations of the floats. Because we're only hearing from them once every 10 days, there's a pretty big margin of error for projecting out where a float is going to be 10 days from now. But we can, depending on where the float is, sort of estimate where it's going to be in the three to five day range. 
but it's really a surprise sometimes when we get um, our float, a new profile coming in and we say, okay, where's, where's the float now? Right now we have a float that is really far north um, in the Gulf and it's every time it's going down and collecting a full profile, it's hitting the bottom and it's not affecting the floats operationally in terms of it's still able to get to the surface and transmit data but that bio-optical sensor that is mounted on the bottom of the float is getting some mud on it and so that bio-optical data is just not good right now um, so there there are definitely some challenges there's not much you can do in the way of driving the floats we've tried to do that a little bit um, but with 10 day cycles it's it's super hard to do that yeah it's fascinating you guys are doing an incredible job thanks Jen. Yeah. It i still don't see any questions so i'm going to be a bad moderator again and ask another one if that's okay <laughs> i'm back to your edna component is that also transmitted via satellite it's all processed within the bgc components or how, how does that work yeah. in your system yeah i kind of flew through those slides sorry chris um so the edna component while it would be just incredible to have something like that on mounted on the floats itself i feel like it's an idea that keeps coming up we just don't have the technology to do it right now but the eDNA component is strictly coming from that uh, the sediment trap time series. So the moored um, collections that we're getting, that we're getting physical particulates, which we're bringing back to the lab once every six months and then processing and extracting the DNA and sending it off for sequencing. So that's definitely not happening in real time. We only have six months of data in right now. Um, we've got another six months of sediments that we've just got but we need to extract and send them off so that's a that's a much slower process but we're trying to make a connection between it and the data that the float are giving to us just to kind of maximize the meaningfulness of what are the floats telling us about the open ocean and how we can make other connections to other data sets and that's going to be tremendously valuable especially with the evolving marine biodiversity observation network and some of these other programs that are looking at biological capabilities within IUS because that's kind of like the untapped treasure right now is to be able to connect those measurements up with all of the living marine resources. And it's great to see the progress that's being made here because that really is gonna be the connection between the surface and the deep sea. Yeah, I, we think so too. Thanks. We're coming up on the hour. We have about two or three minutes left. One final opportunity for anybody for questions. Jenner Jorge, am I missing anybody that you see? This is Jorge Chris. I just want to congratulate Emily for the presentation and the exciting work that she's bringing to us. I've been waiting for months to hear more about this, and I'm especially looking forward for that collaboration that you mentioned in um, integrating your data into uh, the Chico's uh, Gandalf uh, Geo Viewer. So, um, um, again, congratulations, and we hope that we can have you in the future uh, with more updates, Emily. Thank you so much, Jorge. Emily, we do have a hand up from Russ Miller. Russ, I unmuted you, so feel free to talk if you can. There you go. I've been struggling with the controls just a bit. Um, we're in the Great Lakes uh, with uh, Noah Glural and uh, Sigler and looking at uh, not BGC floats, but um, using shallower floats for Great Lake applications. Uh, this is a great presentation. Um, and a great integrated project it looks like you're you're running so um thank you very much for uh for going into it thanks so much for uh thanks for that russ and, and thanks for your work in the great lakes i know that there's been some discussion about uh bgc floats in the great lakes i'm not sure where where that stands uh now i think it might be challenging just with the the depth and that biofouling question that someone asked earlier but um right. yeah I think that's, yeah, that sounds like our assessment at this point. Uh, gliders are about 60 days. We get um, significant, start to get fouling. Uh, so thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And if it's okay with you, we'll make this presentation available on the DQS website and we'll send that to participants. And if, of course, if anybody thinks of any additional questions, 
feel free to reach out at any time. Jen, did you have any other comments? Not on my end. Thank you, Emily, so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, it was great having you here. Thanks, Emily. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.